You know, uh, when I first started teaching and stuff, I, uh, I liked to teach about stuff that could show how smart I was. I wanted to baffle everybody, everybody and amaze them. But, uh, well, I, I, I've, I've, I've taught a few times since then, and I realized that it really doesn't matter how much you know, because in a hundred years you'll be dead anyways. <laughs> what matters is what you do in this life. And uh, so I've tried to reorient my messages to not show how smart I am, but to be more helpful. Um, okay, so the, uh, two weeks, or not two weeks ago, but two times ago that I, that I preached, I guess it was in probably February, like third or fourth uh, Sunday of February, I taught on Naomi, and that lesson was about dealing with loss. And we looked at the book of Ruth, okay? Now, last week we looked at um, the book of Ruth again, but we looked at the character of Ruth in the book instead of Naomi, and we looked at the idea of enduring faith. This time, we're going to look at the character of Boaz. And um, Chuck did lie to you. He said that this was a two-parter. This was a three-parter. I, uh, I had written these um, really quite, quite a deal back, and I was just never really had the opportunity to, you know, to do three consecutive weeks. But, I mean, it worked fairly okay, I guess. Um, okay, this time, guys, I want you to see this. Everybody look up here and see this. This is my phone. I am making sure that I don't go for, for over 30 minutes tonight. That's what that's for, okay? So if it goes off, I apologize. It's for your best interest that I keep it up here. <laughs> Ruth is still before our first Samuel, right? Goodness sakes. Okay, we're reading in, in the book of Ruth. So go ahead and hit that first point on the PowerPoint there, buddy. And an investment is something we spend our energy or, or our resources on. Okay, that, that's, that's what an investment is. When, when people talk about investments, they'll often talk, talk, uh, talk about retirement accounts. You know, you'll hear them talk about you know, savings accounts or, or you know, I, I, I bought a house. You know, that was an investment. You know, all these, these, people have a lot of ideas of, of, of things about investments. Okay? But um, go to the next point there. The, the truth is we're always investing in something. Whether we like it or not, every single moment that we spend on this earth, we're, we are spending it investing into something. When you are watching the television, you are investing your time and your effort into paying attention to television. When you are spending time with your kids, you are investing time and effort into your kids. When you are, you see what I mean? Investment isn't just finances. Investment is something that each of us does every single moment of the day, whether you like it or not. Right now, you're in a service. You are investing into learning about God. When you get up in the morning and you're going to work, you're investing in your job. Everything we do is always investing into something. And there's a lot of things, you know, I already mentioned a few things. Family is a big thing. Uh, TV shows or video games, depending on your age group. If you're younger, it's going to be video games. If you're older, it's going to be TV shows, usually. Not always, but you know, I typically don't see 50 or 60 year olds playing video games. Sometimes they do. I'm just. Nothing against that. I'm not, not condemning anybody. I'm just saying. Um, uh, you invest in God. You invest in business. There's a lot of different things like that. Ruth chapter 2 is where we're going to start out. We're going to look at, at, at the third main character of the book of Ruth. We've already looked at Naomi. We've already looked at Ruth. Now we're going to look at Boaz. And Boaz is, is a smart guy. <laughs> but more important than that, he's a genuine guy. Yeah. And uh, he was a businessman. And I think, I think maybe he understood a little bit about how God works because he understood how business worked and because he understood how the law works. Now, I'll kind of explain what I mean by that because if you just take what I said, that might sound like I'm being crazy. So, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Naomi had a kinsman. I'm sorry, let me back up for those of you, who, if there's anybody here who doesn't know the story of Ruth. There is a woman, an Israelite woman who lives in Israel. Her name is Naomi. She moves to a neighboring country called Moab uh, with her husband and her two sons. They all get married. Or Naomi doesn't get married because she's already married. Her two kids get married. And throughout the course of them living in Moab, her husband and her two sons die. So she goes back to live in Israel. 
And one of her daughters, daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, I hate that, it should be daughter-in-laws, I think, but it's daughters-in-law, I hate that. Uh, one of her daughters-in-law named Ruth moves back to Israel with her. So that's kind of where we pick up here. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great worth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Skip down to verse 4. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord, be, uh, may the Lord bless you. And I want to stop there for a second, just to kind of look at uh, the character of Boaz. Um, now, I already mentioned last week about how a kinsman redeemer was responsible for going to somebody who had lost their husband and redeeming that. Basically, um, if they would, it's, it's, don't think of it like we would now, but you would buy the property and the wife would be included in that. Okay, So you would buy this dead person's wife, who was a close relative of yours, and you would have sex with her. And if she had a child, the, the inheritance that you bought would then go to that child. And that son would not be counted as yours, it'd be counted as hers. Okay, so Ruth has, Ruth and Naomi have a close family redeemer that is completely uninterested. He's uninterested to the point that he doesn't even know what the heck's going on. Okay, Boaz isn't the first person in line, so it wasn't his responsibility to go to Naomi and Ruth, so keep that in mind, okay? So, the, the, Verse 1 in chapter 2 just introduces Boaz and how he is connected with this whole fiasco that's going on. It's just saying that he is a, um, a kinsman redeemer. Then in verse 4, it shows Boaz coming from Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem was just a short distance away. You wouldn't actually grow your crops in the city, obviously. So you would have to go from the city to your crops. So when it says he came from Bethlehem, he wasn't traveling some great distance. It was like a, you know, probably about a 20-minute walk. It wasn't that really really that big of a deal. Um, but then it says, uh, he goes to, to his reapers, the people who are taking care of, his, care of his crops, and he says, may the Lord be with you. So, uh, first off, Boaz was known for his good character. How does he address his workers? He doesn't say, go walk up and say, hey, you know, how's, how's the work going? He goes up and instantly he blesses them. And look at the relationship that he has with his reapers. When he says this, what do they say back to him? May the Lord bless you. Now, we know that the spiritual atmosphere of Israel is pretty dark at this time from what we've already looked at uh, last week and a couple weeks ago and also from what the book of Judges tells us. Um, but here we have Boaz, this guy who's just this nice guy, and he's introduced as a nice guy. He's not introduced as, you know, this, <laughs> this uninterested person. Um, and the first thing I really want to say, go to that next point there, is that God brings blessings to those with the character to receive it. Now, I, I don't want to make this sound like it's all about our works. I don't. But, when someone has a proven, let me put it differently. You have two children. One of your children spends every single dime that they make. If they get money, they instantly lose it on whatever, it doesn't matter what. Then you have another child who thinks about what to do with their money, they plan and they invest their money. You decide to leave an inheritance of money to a child. Well, which one will you be more likely to leave it to? Well, the one who's gonna use it right. You don't wanna give it to the one that's just gonna throw it out the window, right? I mean, that's just common sense. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. God brings some blessings to those who have character for it that you would have missed otherwise. See, Boaz is just this general, general nice guy. He's just doing what God wants him to in the land of Israel, not looking for anything from it. He's just doing the right thing. Stay with me, because it seems like, well, how did you get that from this? Well, hold on. <laughs> See, I've read the whole book multiple times, so I'm going back to things. Uh, God is growing character in you for his glory and his plans. That's just something to keep in mind. Boaz didn't know that God was doing that. Yet, here he was down the road, an, old, an older man now. So in Ruth chapter 2, verse 5 through 9, uh, let's kind of pick it up. Then Boaz said to a servant who, uh, servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? Talking about Ruth. Uh, the servant in charge of the reapers replied, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said uh, to, uh, to Ruth, 
Uh, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, I'm sorry, uh, did I miss a line there? Uh, no. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your, uh, let your eyes be on the field, which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. So here we have a few things. Go to the next point there. Boaz wasn't an excessively rich person. He was an average businessman. We can deduce that from what the book itself says, but I won't bore you with the details. Moral of the story being, he wasn't poor, he wasn't rich. He was just well off. Um, middle class, I guess, is what you would say. And give, one thing that Boaz shows us is give, give from your ability. Don't, don't try and give past what God has enabled you to. You know what I mean? For instance, if God, if God gives you a job, and you're working. Should you spend all of your money giving it to the church and then say, I don't have any money to help my parents? I don't have any money to um, pay for rent? Well, no, you should wisely manage that, right? That's kind of what I'm talking about here. You guys are, are, are looking as, as tired as I feel. <laughs> and uh, when I'm this tired, I have a really hard time staying on, staying on, on topic. So you guys are going to have to really look more alive, okay? <laughs> That's how I feel, Jimmy, honestly. <laughs> Uh, so give from your ability. Just because you can't meet every need doesn't mean you can't meet any need. Boaz was not the richest man around, but he saw a need that he could meet. Here was this widow who lived with the widow, and he tells her, he says, I have heard about how you left everything, your gods, your family, your everything, to go and take care of this woman, Naomi. And that was a very good thing that you did. So I, I'm watching out for you. You know what I mean? You have this guy who, who sees somebody who did something righteous. And so he goes out of his way to do what he can. So I mean, oftentimes we think, well, I don't have the means, I don't have the ability, I don't have the time or the money to give to everything. That's okay, you don't have to give to everything. Give to what you can. See what I mean? Give from your ability. And that's what we see with Boaz. Especially, uh, I want to specifically focus on verse 22 here. Well, I'll go, I'll, we'll hop down to verse 14 and go through 16. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and, and had some left. Now, if you know the law, the Israelite law, it was law that people, when you were harvesting, when you were taking your crops out of the field, when it was harvest time, you had to leave what was left for the poor people. Okay, What Boaz is doing here isn't the law. What Boaz is doing here is over the law. He's doing more than the law required. And it also says that a lot of other people weren't even doing the bare minimum. He says here, don't go to another field lest you get beaten. Lest something bad happen to you. Uh, verse 15. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded her servants, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. See, he's saying, let her glean even above and beyond what's on the ground. Well, that's quite a big difference. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles, and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So let her have from the sheaves, and also, as you're gathering, purposely take some and drop it, besides what you drop on accident. So in other words, there will be ample opportunity for her and Naomi to have enough to eat. Now, why was Boaz doing all this? Because Ruth and Naomi were widows. God tells us to look out for the widows. And here we have, we have Boaz, Boaz specifically going out of his way for the widows. And then if you hop down to verses 19 through 23, it says, her mother-in-law, Ruth, talking about Ruth with Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi, then said to her, where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. See, Boaz didn't have to grab an opportunity to somehow manipulate God into blessing him. Boaz had a proven character. He was a person who did what God wanted for many, many years. And so because of that, God was able to bring Ruth into Boaz's field because he knew that Boaz would do the right thing and provide for her. See, it never says that God directed Ruth to the field, but what are the chances? It's like the book of Esther. Did you know that God isn't mentioned in the book of Esther? 
But are we to assume that all those things just randomly happen by chance? See, I mean, that, that's not the idea of the book. And with Ruth, it's the exact same thing. She just happens to end up in this field. So we have God bringing by Ruth to Boaz so that he could take care of these two widows. Well, so Boaz is getting all this stuff taken out from him, but he sure isn't getting anything back. Well, A, hold on, hold on. But B, Boaz would have done it regardless of whether he did anything back or not because that's what righteous people do. God's people are called to sacrifice themselves, not to save themselves. There's a very big difference there. Verses, um, I think I'm in 20 now. Naomi said to her, this is in chapter 2, by the way. Naomi said to her daughter, daughter may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, see, to the living and to the dead, not just to me and you, but he's also doing a kindness to our, to our dead husbands. See? So just to kind of fill you in there. Again, Naomi said to her, uh, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth, which means he could redeem us. This could be good. Then Ruth the Moabite said, furthermore, do you understand the idea of that? Basically, so your land and your possessions don't go outside of your family line. Does that make sense? You have you and a brother, you, your brother dies without having a child with his wife. So you marry your brother's wife. When she has a kid, it counts as your brother's, your dead brother's son. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? And so then the inheritance would go to him. Okay. Um, then Ruth the Moabite said, "Furthermore, he said to me, you shall not, uh, you shall stay close to my servants until they have finished uh, all my harvest. In other words, stay, stay here the rest of the harvest season." Um, and then we'll read through to verse uh, twenty-three. And Naomi said to Ruth, her uh, daughter-in-law, "It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids, so that others do not fall upon you in another field. In other words, so you don't get mistreated. People are not following the law, and you will, you will get beaten." So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the, and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So uh, go to the next slide, next point there, buddy. Uh, Boaz was, was generous past what was expected. He was an older man. He had done well all his life and expected nothing. And so because of that, he had a name in the community Bringing, going back to this Easter egg thing that we're doing um, and we started taking up. Did you know that people can tell when you're witnessing to them just to get something out of the relationship? Like maybe if I do something, they'll start coming to my church. People know when you're doing that. But when you get a name as the church that is reaching out to people without expecting anything back. The same thing happens as what happened with Boaz here. People just know who you are in the community. Because you've established a name. And that's what happened with Boaz. He was an older man now. He had gone his whole life establishing a name of doing the right thing. So here we have um, the next point there. God looks for who to bless. Did you know that? God is actually actively looking. Go to the next point there, buddy. God is actually actively looking for people to bless. He's just looking for people to bless. Unfortunately, sometimes when we harden our hearts and we continue to live in sin, we continue to rebel against him, he has no choice but to remove blessings. But it's not like he's just sitting there like waiting to jerk something back. You know, people oftentimes think that God is a lot like a fisherman. He throws his hook out there, and then when he gets a bite, he doesn't reel it in, he just kind of lets the fish stay on the hook for a while. Brings it in, then maybe lets the fish take it out again. You know, but that's not God, though. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's not God, <laughs> And uh, I think sometimes we get it in our, in our head that that's how it works. Um, so God is actively looking for who to bless. Don't grumble and complain, but joyfully do what you are able to do. Boaz was not complaining, oh great, here's two more widows that I have to take care of on, count, on top of my household, on top of... No, he didn't do that at all. He joyfully took care of Ruth and Naomi. He saw a need that he could meet, and he did it without grumbling or complaining. See, often as we'll do is, is we'll do it, you know, just so people will say how, how good we are. But our heart won't be in it, and we'll spend the whole time complaining about it. And then, when something goes wrong, because it usually will, we turn around and say, see, I shouldn't have done it in the first place. Then why did you? You've done nothing but complain about it the whole time. That's why 2 Corinthians says God loves a joyful giver. God, God could take all your money away. He gave it to you, didn't he? 
He could take it all away. He doesn't want to. He wants to bless you, and he wants to use you to bless others. That's what he wants to do. Unfortunately, our plans oftentimes get in the way of God's plans. So in Ruth chapter 2, verse 10 through 13, Um, chapter 2, sorry, I didn't know if I made that clear. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, what have I, um, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? See, she was an Israelite. The law technically didn't really apply to her. Technically. She hadn't gone through any sanctification or anything process. She wasn't married to an Israelite anymore. Like, you see what I mean? She was a Moabitess. She didn't belong to the promises of God. She... You know what I mean? Why, why are you doing this to me? Um, Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. See what he said there? After your obligation was gone, you still did what was right to Naomi. And that hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, it's been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed has spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not uh, like one of your maidservants. Oftentimes people will say, a lot of atheists will oftentimes say, you know, Christians, all they ever do is pray about stuff. They never actually do anything. That can be true sometimes. Sometimes we don't do something that we could do. And then we pass it off as, oh, I prayed about it. That is, that is true sometimes. But I will say that uh, it kind of needs to be met with both. You need to pray about it, and you need to do it. See what I mean? Like, <laughs> it doesn't have to be either or. Um, but Boaz was a generous person, uh, but he specifically invested into Ruth. See, he was a generous person anyways, but he took special note of Ruth. Investment in this context is what I mean is special attention. He was investing in people and whatnot, but he took special time to invest into the person of Ruth. Um, he saw some, somebody in need, and he saw a way that he could fill it. Go to the next point there, buddy. Uh, invest in accord with character. When you find somebody specially deserving, find a way to bless them. I'm not saying don't be generous. So let me kind of clarify what I'm saying. Be a generous person. Care for people, everyone. Don't play favorites, absolutely. But don't give money to a fool. Have you seen people who could work but instead decide to sit on their butts all day? Have you seen people who could work but instead they gamble at every time, every chance that they get? Have you seen people who could work but instead they spend all their money on alcohol? That's not really a wise way to spend your money. So what do you think is going to happen if you give them money without teaching them how to use the money? Well, they're going to use the money on what they've already used the money on. You see what I mean? And that's what, that's all I'm saying here. I'm not saying don't invest in people. Invest in everyone. But when you see someone, you, you have to invest in people according to their character. I guess that's what I'm really getting at. You, you know what I mean? Like, there are some people who make really good financial investments. So you can invest in them by helping them out financially in that path. See what I mean? But then there's other people who aren't really smart with their money, so how could you invest with them? You could spend time with them to teach them how to spend their money. See, I'm still investing in the person, but according to their character. Because if I just throw money at an alcoholic, they're going to buy beer. And I will have been helping them to drink themselves to death. Coming from a family of alcoholics, I can't do that in good conscience. But I can do what I can to help the person. See the difference there? And that's all I'm saying. Um, Boaz gave blessing, he gave food, he gave protection, and he gave encouragement to Ruth. Did you notice how encouraged Ruth was at the end of this little part that I just read? I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me. You have comforted me. Obviously, everybody knew that, knew that he gave her food and protection, absolutely. But what she said is, you didn't, she didn't say, you gave me food and protection. She said, you have comforted me. Here I am, a widow. My husband has died. We're alone. Out here. We, I don't know any of these strange people. Naomi has a history of them from way back when, but I don't know any of these people. You know, and then 
Still, you have comforted me. In Ruth chapter 4, we, we, we see this progressing. And I talked about this last week about how uh, Ruth asks him to marry her. And that was in chapter 3, I think. Um, yeah. And so then that takes us to chapter 4 this week. Um, excuse me. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend. Excuse me. Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now, this is the kinsman redeemer that I was talking about, the one that was closer. Now, when they were handling a business transaction, they would do it in the, um, what did I just say in that passage? The entryway of the gate. The, uh, uh, it was just right there. Come on, Michael. Uh, the, the, well, I guess it's not in this translation. Basically, inside the gate, there was kind of like a marketplace. And that would be where a lot of times uh, you would do any public transactions. There would be leaders or, or of the community that would be assembled there during the daytime. And so for Boaz to go there, he was just sitting there waiting to take care of business. This is the same day that Ruth asks him to marry her in chapter 3. And uh, so that's why chapter 3 ends with Naomi telling Ruth, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. In other words, you ask him to marry you, you'll have your answer by the end of the day. Wow. See, because Boaz can't just marry her because he's not the closest family redeemer. Um, so, here we are in verse 2. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relatives, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech, her now dead husband. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. In other words, he's telling him, hey, you've been neglecting your job of marrying this. You know, you need to take care of this. This whole Naomi Ruth situation, you've been neglecting it for month after month. Because if you go back, the harvest season was over now. And the kinsman redeemer still hadn't done a thing about it. So uh, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it. And I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. This guy that he's talking to, he says, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the fields from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Boaz is slick. Oh man, he's slick. Okay, hold on, let me come back to that. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. May you have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Okay, so let me kind of explain it there. I'll stop there, and I'll read the rest of it just saying it. But first off, Naomi has no inheritance. Inheritors. Inheritors. She has no inheritors. She still has the land. She just has nobody to give it to. Her husband's dead. Her kids are dead. She's at the age where even if she was to find a husband like this, she's past the age of reproduction. <laughs> so things aren't looking great for that. So... This seems like a really good investment, but this guy has no idea that Ruth is attached to the deal. See, he had a job to do according to the law. He didn't even know that Ruth was involved in the deal because he was so uncaring for the widow. Do you see what I mean? Boaz looked out for the widow. This guy, this Mr. Oblivious here, is completely whew, in next field, unknowing that there are two widows that are completely uncared for, that it was his responsibility to take care of months ago. Well, that doesn't look good for him. So this is his solution. Yeah, sure, I'll buy it. Naomi's old. She'll probably die in the next couple of days, and I can just give the inheritance to my kids. Well, hold on now. <laughs> hold on. She was likely to die soon and couldn't produce. It was a good investment. The addition of Ruth made it a potential loss because that means I have to marry this young woman who then I have to have sex with. You can't just marry her. You also have to have sex with her so that you will produce a child. You cannot marry her and withhold from her. So he says, I can't do this because if she does, if she does bear a child, now I will have lost my money in investing in this land. Plus, I don't get to keep the land anyways. You see, this has now become a huge problem for him. So he's like, I'm not interested anymore. Okay? So go to the next point there. Take the loss. Boaz was willing to take the loss for the good of Naomi and Ruth. See, the child wouldn't count as, as Boaz's technically. I'll come back to that in just a second. It would, but not. Just roll with me. 
technically, it wouldn't count as Boaz's child. It would count as Ruth's dead husband, and I think his name was like Killian or something like that. Some weirdo name. Something you never hear. Uh, anyways, and, uh, but Boaz was willing to take that loss. See what I mean? Yeah. In a world that always tries to get one up, tries to always beat everybody else at the game, Boaz was a person who was willing to take the loss to do what was right. You see what I mean? That's the kind of care that God has for widows. Does that make sense? For widows and orphans, God has a heart for the people who are cast out by society. And as Ruth and Naomi were both widows, there would have been assumed by the community that they were these wicked people. Because God wouldn't have let two righteous, two righteous people have lost their husbands. See what I mean? So they would have been an outcast of the society of the outcasts. It was bad enough losing your husband, but when you lose your husband and your two kids, see what I mean? They would have been ostracized in the community. And here's Boaz saying, I don't care if you're ostracized in the community, I'm taking care of you. Here's Boaz saying, I don't care if it's, if it's my loss, I'm still going to take care of you. That is a godly investment, and that's the kind of things that we've been called to do. Give up your time, give up your energy, give up your finances to build a future in somebody else. Don't just throw money to beggars, invest in people. Invest in them. Because you can make a difference, even in one person's life. Boaz wisely worded it so the closer redeemer would reject the offer. See, he made it seem really good at first, leaving out the issue of Ruth on purpose, so that the guy would think, hey, this is a pretty good deal. This is my lucky day. But then he throws a wrench into it right when this guy is in good spirits to break his spirits and make him want to sell the land, get rid of the land, and not buy it. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the fields in the head of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess. Oh. <laughs> oh. Things have turned dark for me. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> so you have a, little, a big difference there. And Boaz was very, very smart. Because if he had, would have brought Ruth up first, it wouldn't have been such a shock. And the guy might not have been so inclined to say no. See what I mean? But Boaz worded it in such a way where it, it was too big of a shock and he couldn't get over it. Bo Boaz took care of it that same day because there was a widow in need. And the Redeemer didn't see a need to fill but a loss of profit. Boaz saw a need to fill. The, re the other redeemer, the close redeemer, redeemer saw, saw a loss of profit. He saw money as more important, important than the person. He saw his loss as more important than the other person's gain. Boaz saw the other person's gain as more important than his loss. That's a very big difference. So we see here that the Redeemer was completely oblivious to the situation. Here are these two widows, which wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for Boaz. And he completely is oblivious to this. And so he lost a chance at blessing without even knowing it. See, the Redeemer who said no to Ruth, he lost his chance at receiving a blessing, and he didn't even know they even lost it. Boaz received a blessing when he wasn't even looking for a blessing. See, this is, this is why when we give tithes and offerings so that God will bless us, we miss the whole big picture. See what I mean? You honor God, not because you'll get something in, 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 in payback, but because you honor God. See what I mean? And Boaz understood that. Boaz invested into others generously and was included in Jesus' genealogy. Boaz goes on to marry Ruth. They bear a, bear a child who is then the ancestor of the first really good king of Israel, not Saul, David, who has a promise given to him that he will keep, that God will keep one of David's descendants on the throne forever. So David has a son named Solomon, which is a very wise king. Things are looking up. He has a son who's a complete idiot named Rehoboam. The, king, the kingdom's torn into, and that goes on for a while until Babylon comes in and just destroys Jerusalem. Okay, well, what happened to that promise? Go down a few more years, and you have Jesus, the Christ, born through Boaz's line. And the king sits on the throne forever. 
You see how Boaz received this blessing. He didn't even know he was getting because he wasn't looking for a blessing. He was looking to do what's right. God is looking for people who will look to do what's right. Not so we can get something out of it. So we can do what's right. The Redeemer lost a chance at the blessing, but Boaz received it in his stead. And every genealogy of Jesus has Boaz in it. Only some of them have Ruth. See that? Boaz sacrificed a lot. And because of that, he is included in every genealogy of Jesus. Ruth isn't. Boaz is. Was Ruth not important? No, we looked last week about how important of a character Ruth was. But that's not the point. The point is Boaz did what he could to do what was right. And God blessed him for it. That's the point. So in chapter 4, verse 11 through 12... Uh, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. I didn't finish reading that section before. Um, the closest fellow said, I cannot redeem it for myself because, uh, because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. Now this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption of the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. This was, this was a way of saying, I give over my privilege of, of walking on the land. You would take off your shoe because that's how you would walk on the land. You would say, here, I'm giving the right to you. It was just a, a, a metaphor, you know, a symbol. That's it. Um, uh, a man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of uh, at, at a station uh, in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, and he removed the sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have brought, bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Melon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Melon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brother or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. So here we have a little bit of a uh, exception. To the rule. Now, remember, I said it doesn't count as Boaz's child. Well, in this case, it kind of does, and this is why. Okay. So the child that they have is Ruth. It counts as, as the dead husband. But Boaz is an old man who doesn't have anybody to inherit his inheritance. So the child is then adopted as his child too. See how that works. So now, Boaz also gets someone to inherit his land. He continues his name and the name of the deceased. In Jesus' genealogy, does it say Ruth's dead husband's name? No, it says Boaz's name, not Ruth's first husband. But doesn't the child count as the dead husband's child? Yeah. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Um... Anyways, going on here. Um, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrath, uh, Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, from Tamar, uh, whom Tamar bore to Judah, to the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, this is a whole long thing, so I'm not going to get into that, but this is a threefold blessing, basically, and I'm going to just reword it so you'll understand. Because I don't want to keep you guys here at all. Um, oh, it's 7.30 already. Never mind. I don't want to keep you here past 7.40. Uh-huh. Um, the three-part blessing. Be built up. Grow. Have, 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 killed, have children. May your, may your household grow. Be honored. May people look up to you. May you have, a, have an honored name. May the deeds that you do go before you. Uh, and then the third part, be strong, is what that all means together. See, because they said it in these terms that referred all these things that happened earlier in you can read it there, uh, where it says, uh, make the woman who's coming to your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house, so have a bunch of kids. May you achieve wealth in Ephrath and become famous in Bethlehem. May, may your name be honored for what you've done. Um, and then in verse 12, may, may, uh, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. May you be strong. Which is interesting to note that Boaz was actually of the house of Judah. So that's kind of interesting. Um, 
act as though you are Jesus' heir, and the and uh, and this will one day be his future city and be his city. So I mean, act like that. Act in such a way where, in all things, you can know I acted with integrity and I did what was right. I invested in other people, and if Jesus was born in my house, I would have acted in such a way that would have brought honor to him. So I mean, that's that's the kind of idea of Boaz here. God is looking for people with good character that he can use. Go to the last two points there, buddy. Don't look at what you can gain, but what you can invest into. Life is too short to spend it all on you. What, where is your time going to? Is it only on things that you enjoy doing? Where is your money going to? Is it only on pleasures of the world? Invest in something beyond yourself because your life is way too short to waste it on pointless things. Just way too short. You can have hobbies, you can have fun. But make sure that that's not all your life is about. You know what I mean? If you don't have kids, don't worry. Kids aren't the only way to invest in things. You can also invest in people. You know what I mean? So we're going to close it there. I just really want, want you guys to tune into those last points there. Don't look at what you can gain, but look at what you can invest into. Look at what you can change. Look at what you can do about something. I know it's become very popular nowadays to sit around complaining about stuff. You see people protesting everything nowadays, and the news is just so negative all the time. Instead of looking at what the government should be doing or what other people should be doing, ask yourself, God, or ask God, what can I do, God? Say, change your perspective. Don't be sucked into the negativity that everybody else seems to be having in the world. Yeah. Can I have uh, the uh, chuckle? Can you uh, close this?